Imagine being able to take a pill that would give you an insane amount of power. That'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? In fact, Netflix thought of that idea in a movie called Project Power. And in Project Power, uh, the main character takes a pill. And as he takes a pill, he starts to describe what his power is going to be like. Uh, he says he gets his power from the world's strongest animal. The strongest animal in the world, he says, is a shrimp, a pistol shrimp. And as I watched it, I thought, oh, come on, a shrimp is puny, it's tiny, it's weak. There's no way that a pistol shrimp can be the world's strongest animal. So I reached out to my friend uh, and biologist, Katie Zimmerman. Katie is a member of the Fellowship family. And so I did some fact checking with her and I said, hey, Katie, is the pistol shrimp the strongest animal in the world? <laughs> I love Katie's quote. Katie wrote back to me and says this. She says, uh, it is extremely strong, but powerful is subjective terminology. The biomechanics of that little creature is insane, she said. You know, power is interesting, isn't it? It's an interesting topic. As we are in this series called Real Power, we have seen God's power, and we're going to unpack that a little bit more today. I love last week when Warwick talked about how the God's power has taken the rule book of power, and it has taken it and just ripped it in half. But there's a problem. <laughs> there's a problem with that is though, even though it's been ripped in half, we still hold on to a page. And that page that we hold on to produces in us this mentality of we plus, like that little pill that we can take to give us a little bit more. Uh, we think we plus, uh, just a little bit more money, and then we would really be powerful. A little bit more influence. Maybe we want that right kind of wasta, or maybe it's just a little bit more time, a little bit more thinking, a little bit more understanding. Whatever it is, uh, we think it's we plus something else that gives us true power. And there's a problem with that. You see, that rule book for power is quite complicated. It comes with a, a lot of baggage. Probably the worst baggage is that we realize that we are pretty powerless by ourselves. If it's just left up to us, we know we'll fail. That's why we're always looking for something to add so we can think, okay, if I had enough relationships, if I had uh, enough time to work hard for that promotion, then I would have real power. But the truth is, as we'll see today, the truth is that real power isn't found in a we plus mentality. No, real power is found in a he alone culture. Not we plus, but he alone. That's where we find real power. We'll unpack that, we plus versus he alone thinking in our time together today. I love this quote that Warwick shared with us last week. I'm going to read it again uh, because it really summarizes this idea of combating we plus thinking in our idea of power. Uh, Warwick says this. He said, in this world's eyes, there is nothing more powerless than a man who is naked, nailed to a cross with a spear hole in his side and dead. You see, to a world saturated with we plus thinking, of course, a source of power of someone that can't even protect their own life, it gives it up. Of course, that seems weak. But then where it continued, he said, yet in God's eyes, in God's eyes, there is nothing more powerful than the news of this man's death. Anyone or anything who steals our gaze from that scene robs us of God's power and inserts themselves as counterfeit power promising us a defective dominion that God knows nothing of. We're going to continue to talk about power today. We're going to see that God addresses that we plus mentality, that understanding in the old rule book of power. And in fact, true power, God's power, it may even be seen as weakness or foolishness. 
we'll talk about that general principle of God's power seeming like folly in a we plus culture. And then after we talk about the general explanation, we'll kind of funnel down and we'll talk about a specific consideration. And after we uh, unpack that specific consideration, then we'll get down even more narrow into the funnel and we'll talk about our personal application. So general explanation, then the specific consideration, and then the personal application. Let's pray before we get into God's word. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that you give us to hear in your word proper thinking about your power. So God, I pray that you would soften our hearts, that you would open up our eyes, unplug our ears, help us to hear your truth, even for the very first time. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name through the Spirit. Amen. All right, so before we get to the personal application or even the specific consideration, we are going to look at a general explanation of this we plus thinking and what it does to our understanding of power. Uh, you see, when we talk about the message of Jesus, when we talk uh, about this message that Jesus has done everything and it's nothing that we can do, that Jesus is the one that makes us right with God, when we share the message of the cross, it will be seen as foolishness. The message of Jesus is foolishness in a we-can-do-it culture or I-can-do-it culture. <laughs> No, this we plus mentality has seeped its way into our thinking so deeply. Sometimes we may even be afraid of this. But let's look at what Paul says to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting with verse 18, he says, For the word of the cross is folly, it's foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, oh, it's the power of God. For it is written, then he quotes Isaiah 29, he says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. This word that he uses, the word of the cross, is folly. It's a Greek word, moreno. And moreno started out as a word that simply meant kind of bland. It was bland. Uh, it was a word that was something without taste, or uh, Hippocrates uses it when, when there's a nerve ending that's dying. Socrates uses it to explain an animal moving slowly in the winter time. But as language develops, this word moreno uh, develops a very sharp edge to it. It's almost like an insult to someone, like a, like a slap in the face. You see, to call someone a fool was to say that they were unable to function, that they were missing out, that because they didn't know uh, certain information or because they were just an idiot, that they were completely incapable. So it's a way of calling someone just a complete moron or someone who's daft. It was this huge insult. It was a huge insult. And so Paul says, you guys will get the biggest insult. Everyone is going to think that you are absolutely out of your minds. And Paul knew firsthand what that was like. All through the book of Acts, we read through Acts a couple of weeks ago, all through the book of Acts, we see this same general principle that this message of the cross is foolishness. Look, Paul in Acts 17, Paul was mocked. Uh, in Acts 18, the proconsul Gallio said that the dispute between Paul and the, the Jewish leaders, that it was frivolous folly. It was just idiotic banter. It was completely stupid. Uh, Paul then was declared to be out of his mind by Festus in Acts 26, over and over and over again. As Paul shares the message, and as followers of Jesus continue to share this message of Jesus, uh, the message is seen as kind of crazy, and followers of Jesus are deemed a little cray-cray. And Paul says that's going to happen. <laughs> That's the, the general explanation of this, is this message of Jesus that we talk about, this power of God to save, will be seen as foolishness. And we don't want to seem foolish. <laughs> There's something in us, though, in a we plus way of thinking to say, no, I, I can do it. I'm not 
that foolish. I'm, I'm not that disabled. No, it's in fact our disability that points to God's ability to save. It's the very fact that we can't add anything to God and we can't add anything to fixing our deepest problem that we are completely out of our depths. We are spiritually completely stuck. We are impotent when it comes to addressing our deepest problem, this rebellion, the sin of when we say we can do it on our own. You see, and Paul says, When you look at the world's deepest problem, we don't boast in uh, the fact that I'm powerful because I'm connected to this community or I'm powerful because my strong man is better than your strong man or uh, that my lineage is better than your lineage. Paul says none of that even matters. We can't add anything to it. You see, God in his work is like uh, the fact that he is using us as weak and as imperfect as we are uh, for his good plan. It's like uh, God is entering a race and he wins a race against a Lamborghini and a Tesla and a McLaren and he's on a unicycle. (laughs) You think, wow, okay. Uh, We're even unicycles. Maybe we have one wheel and it's bent up or uh, (laughs) we are completely foolish. And so when we think about this good news, the powerful news of Jesus and how Jesus saves us from this problem of sin that we have, if we feel weak and foolish when we're about to share it, that's totally okay because we are weak and we are foolish. Where is the one who is wise, Paul says? Where is the scribe? Uh, He says, Greeks, where are the smart folks out there, the ones that have found true wisdom? Uh, The Jews, where are the ones who really have God figured out? Paul says, (laughs) where's the debater of the age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to those who believe. And he says, for the Jews, well, they demand signs. Like they think they have God figured out, that God has done amazing things in the past, like split waters open and uh, rain food from heaven. And and they say, ah, we have God figured out. Well, they demand signs. Remember, the Jews would always demand signs of Jesus. They'd always say, show us, show us a sign, show us a sign, prove it. And he says, for Jews demand signs. And Greeks, well, they seek wisdom. I think if we can figure this stuff out, If we can figure it out up here, then we can live it out. We can have this power. He sees, he says, but we preach Christ crucified. We preach a dead deliverer. And the Jewish people just can't figure that out. Their long-awaited Messiah, uh, the one that is promised, the one that they have been holding their breath for as a complete group He's dead? No, no, that's not how God works. No, no, he's not dead. And that's why it says that he's a stumbling block to Jews. (laughs) And the Gentiles hear of this and the Gentiles say, oh, no, that is so incredibly insane. You have to be completely an idiot to believe that. No, no, no. This is what makes sense up here. Uh, We would just have a little bit more knowledge or a little bit more understanding or a little bit more conversation, a little bit more, and then then we will see the true answer to our problems. <laughs> no, he says, Paul says, we preach Christ crucified. Yep, the stumbling block to Jews. Yep, folly to Gentiles. Okay, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, to the ones God is bringing to him, Christ the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. If God had consulted us on the rescue plan for all of humanity, uh, we would have come, tried to come up with something that appeals to everyone or works for everyone. No, God's plan seems so foolish. And it seems so foolish because it's a reminder that, indeed, he's the one with all the power. We can add nothing. 
It addresses our we plus or a me plus mentality, where we think the answer is within ourselves. The, the good news of Jesus isn't a me plus or a we plus attitude. It's not me plus, it's he alone. It's he alone. That's the good news of Jesus, that Jesus has done everything. An innocent man has paid for the sins of the guilty. An honorable man has restored honor by taking the shame of the rebels, the ones who have been, that should be disowned. That while we were still sinners, that Jesus died for us. And even as followers of Jesus, sometimes we think, okay, uh, I believe that, but certainly there's stuff I have to do to, to unlock more. And the great thing about this he alone culture is as we look at what we should do, it's completely blank. <laughs> what we have to do to earn this salvation is nothing. We don't have to do anything. We simply, we trust that this is true. And in the cross, in the message of Jesus, we see God's power, his dunamis, his, it's like dynamite, his power, not just potential power, but his acting power. He's done for us what we can't do for ourselves. He has conquered death through death, that through Jesus' death, death has been conquered so that anyone that believes in him would have eternal life. <laughs> no amount of we plus thinking is going to conquer death. Only Jesus. He alone is the one that can conquer death. He alone is the one that can settle our twisted souls. He alone is the one who can give us a deep, lasting sense of peace. He is the one that controls everything. And he alone is the one that can reconnect us in a right relationship with God the Father. And that is true wisdom, <laughs> I mean, that's true wisdom. It's true wisdom for us to understand that we don't have the power, that God is the one that has the power to restore and reconnect us, and, and that we trust that he would be the one, like a father that runs after a runaway child. While he is still way off, that the father would run to his kid that we would embrace the fact that even if we're turning our backs on God and we're hurting and heartbroken and pouting, that God still would reach out to us and that his love moves in our hearts first. It's true wisdom to understand that God's place and our place are different, that God's power and our pursuit of power is to try and rob from God, God the very thing that's his. We know that only God can save us. His power, his wisdom. And so if, friends, if you're watching this and you have searched everywhere and you're just frustrated with the fact that you can't do it on your own, it's because you can't do it on your own. Put your trust in Jesus alone, that he died for your sins and that he came back to life. If that's you, just write in the chat section that you'd like to pray with someone, you'd like to talk to someone, we'd love to talk to you about that. If you're a follower of Jesus, I encourage you, I encourage you to share the story of what God has done in your life. Consider your life before Jesus. In fact, that's what Paul does. Paul says, hey, take a special consideration. Consider yourself, he says. Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Uh, you weren't powerful. Uh, not many of you were from noble birth. It's not because of your lineage that God worked in your life. You didn't earn any of this. <laughs> he says, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and detestable in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. <laughs> you know, the Corinthians, oh, they were foolish, weak, lowly, detestable. And it's easy for me to say that about them. 
But I realized that I'm lowly, that I'm weak, that apart from God, I am completely and utterly powerless to change and address the biggest problem that I have. And that's the problem of sin. That I can't do anything to fix my deepest problem without God first intervening, without God acting first. And that's why we can't boast in ourselves. Now, we can't boast in ourselves or our people or our community or our history or our family line or our churches or our leaders or our pastors. We can't boast in anybody because God has done all the work. It's not a, a me plus my community or me plus my thinking or me plus my efforts that has addressed sin in my life. No way. No, he alone addressed my deepest need for forgiveness. He alone paid the price for my sins and for yours. He alone is the one that is coming back to restore the world forever in a right relationship with our creator, the sustainer of the world. And so we see that the specific consideration we consider ourselves, there's nothing I've done to earn my right standing with God. So I can't boast in me or anybody else that I know, because I know a bunch of imperfect people. <laughs> and so do you. If you don't know any imperfect people, just look in the mirror and you'll see someone in desperate need of God's grace, just like me. You know, as we talk and share this message of the cross, as we look at this personal application, Here's a way that we can share it. And let's make sure to make God the hero of our story. Uh, it's God's story in us. It's not what we've done. In sharing what God has done in our story, sometimes we're tempted to say, you know, I searched everywhere and then I found Jesus. Or, you know, I really led a pretty wild life that was actually lots of fun and really interesting. Uh, and then I decided to follow Jesus. <laughs> no. We are completely wretched and stuck without God intervening. There's nothing that we can do to earn our forgiveness. There's absolutely nothing. It has been freely given to us. And so as we talk about what Jesus has done in our lives, uh, here's just a couple very simple phrases. And you can learn more about this, about how to share a 15-second story of what God has done in your life, making him the hero by going to fellowshipdubai.com slash my story. And you just watch an eight minute training video and it is something that will prepare you to share in 15 seconds what God has done in your life. Here are the five simple phrases. Uh, the first one, once there was a time in my life. Talk about what your life was like before Jesus. What was your life like before God saved you? The second, there was once a time in my life when I was. What were you like without Jesus? I was lonely. I was scared. I was desperate. I was compromising. Whatever it is, what was your life like before Jesus? There once was a time in my life I was but God. But God, and here's the time where the hero of the story comes out, but God rescued me from my bad decisions, or God uh, allowed me to feel this connection with him because of Jesus, or God opened my eyes to his truth, but God. And then now, well, what difference does God make in your life now? Uh, now that my eyes have been opened, I can connect with God. I don't have to search for uh, other people's approval of me, or I don't have to scan the online feeds for what people are saying, or I don't have to worry about what might happen in the future, what, whatever it is. Make God the hero of that section too. And then the last, the fifth phrase is a simple question. Do you have a story like that? Go online, fellowshipdubai.com slash my story, and submit your 15-second story. We would love to hear about how God is the hero, even though we are completely weak and powerless. 
In fact, I had an opportunity to visit Katie Zimmerman, the biologist I quoted at the beginning of the message, and I visited her at the Green Planet, and she gave me more reminders of how weak I really am uh, compared particularly to some really powerful animals. So let's go to the Green Planet. All right, so here we are with Katie Zimmerman. Katie is a member of the Fellowship family, and she is the biologist here at the Green Planet in Dubai. Katie, thanks so much for inviting us over. My pleasure. Thank you so much for coming out and checking out this place that I get to spend my days. Um, I am a biologist here, and I have the great joy of taking care of our plants and animals, including our sloth Lola here. The, and now Lola looks like uh, there's pretty powerful fingers there, toes, right? Pretty powerful toes. You said you were going to show us some powerful animals. I definitely have some powerful animals to show you, but they may not look like what you think they should look like. All right, I'm excited. Let's, uh, let's do this. So if you look kind of right behind us, right here, we have some Asian weaver ants. Ants, I know, maybe not your first thought when you think of strong animals, but these ants can lift a hundred times their own weight. Oh, okay. So that's like me lifting maybe a double-decker bus. I mean, that is some significant weight. It's a pretty large amount. That's wild. So the, the weaver ants, even though it seems like I could crush them with my fingers, <laughs> uh, they're actually quite strong. Exactly. Huh. Especially their size. That's Later, we may also meet some other animals. Oh, yeah? Do you, do you have something you can show me that has uh, more power than a weaver ant? Maybe a different power. Mm, I definitely can. <laughs> show me. Ah, so this is uh, a little bit more power than, uh, than I would have. We've seen the power of the weaver ants. Tell us a little bit about this guy. So this is a hyacinth macaw. Her name is Lily. Oh, it's a she. Okay, well tell us about her then. Yes. Hyacinth macaws can be found in the Amazon forest in South America. They're one of the largest parrot species and they have the largest bill. As a result, they've got a lot of force behind that bill. 400 PSI. Can you give that a squeeze for me? This is a yeah. walnut, by the way. Sure. Try to open that walnut, see if you can. I, my hand popped, but, <laughs> but nothing happened. Well, we'll see what Lily can do with that walnut. Uh, no, I can't break it. Oh, as if I needed a reminder of how weak humans are. There you go. One of God's creations just made no work out of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Katie. Thank you so much for giving us time and helping us to see some of the great, powerful creatures that God has. Uh, and we look forward to going back into the studio and resuming our conversation. Definitely. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming. Yeah, and by the way, come check out Green Planet. Uh, it's a great place where you can come. You can see all sorts of animals here. Uh, and, uh, and you also get to see Katie, too, a member of Fellowship. So uh, thanks again, Katie. See you in the studio. Let's go. Katie, thank you so much for showing me around. Uh, you must have one of the coolest jobs uh, in the world. Really, really cool. Uh, I see you're, you're wearing a little bit different uh, uniform though, a little bit different outfit. I love my job, but I don't always like smelling like my job. So decided a wardrobe change was a bit needed. <laughs> so we've talked about uh, the power from animals and also our own human weaknesses, but uh, let's just chat for a little bit about our own weaknesses and, and how we've seen God be the hero of our stories. So tell me a little bit about how, how you found yourself weak and how was God strong, you know? Yeah, so uh, before, before I came to be a follower of Jesus, uh, there, there was a time where I was really struggling for acceptance, um, for people to like me, for to be able to fit in with different groups of people. And I think in doing so, I, I kind of lost myself along the way there. Um, I don't, didn't really know what I wanted or what I liked. I'd convince myself I liked things that I didn't. Uh, just to be able to fit in with different people. And so I think that's something I used to really struggle with and at times still do. 
Definitely, of, of just longing for that kind of approval from others. What about you? What is the time when you, you just felt weak or broken? Oh yeah, uh, there was a time in my life when I looked at the brokenness of my loved ones, my family, my friends, and I wanted to fix it. And so I did everything possible to try and fix other people, uh, not recognizing the fact that I was broken. <laughs> and so it was almost as if I could find value in helping other people and find value in fixing others and ignore my own brokenness. And it left me feeling uh, very empty and very aware of my impotence to affect change in other people. Yeah, yeah. But we're not here just to talk about weakness. Uh, <laughs> but there, uh, it also, but God showed me when I heard the gospel of Jesus and I heard that he died for my sins so that he can repair my relationship with God and I could find true healing in him, I thought, wow, if this God can bring Jesus back from the dead, this isn't a, a God of death. This is a God of life. And it's not a God of sickness. It's a God of health. And I'm grateful that God opened my eyes. I had heard it before uh, in different arenas, this Jesus talk. But there was one time in particular I heard it and I thought, wow, God just opened my eyes to that for the very first time. It was great. Yeah. What, what about you in your journey to connect and process? And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mine was a repair and a, a health of relationship with God. But in your search yeah. to connect and approval, what'd you find? Yeah. So I, I encountered God for the first time, I guess, or, or a Christian community, I suppose, in college. And beforehand, I, I didn't grow up in a Christian family. So I really really was unsure about this. And then I got invited to be, to, to just come to a church service. And I said no. And then they offered pizza and God knows weighed my heart. And then I, I showed up and I, I just met some of the most loving and genuinely kind people I have ever encountered. And I, I just wanted, I just wanted to know more. Um, and I learned that these people loved me so much, not even knowing me, accepted me without, without actually uh, really, really knowing me, just feeling accepted. Um, and I learned it was because of the love of Jesus in them that because Jesus accepted them, they, they shared that so much and so generously and were so invitational mm -hmm. that it, it really just hit me too. And, um, was that foreign? Was that a foreign yeah. shift from constantly scanning and like, okay, what do I need to do? What do I need to do? And then be like, wait, wait a second, you guys approve, you accept me beforehand? Like, yeah. were you waiting for the fine print? So like, belong before I believe? Yeah, like that, that wrecked me. Mm. I, that was, that was a, a whole perspective shift. Um, and it, it made me want to figure out who is this God that, that can do that or who, who shows this love to these people and that they're able to just bestow that so generously on everyone else, like why? Um, and so that, that got me seeking. I think for the first real time, really seeking who is this Jesus? Um, and and I'm, I'm so grateful for that moment and for those people to really just show that in my, show that to me, mm. yeah. Isn't it, isn't it cool how the weakness for, you know, you wanting to belong and you're like, you guys, if you're like me and you're messed up and you'll do anything for approval, you guys, there's an answer in Jesus. The, the same thing I found too when it came to fixing people or changing people yeah. or uh, helping people. I was like, wait, you guys, if you think you have to do it all, guess what? You don't because you can't do it. I've been there. Trust me, there's a better way. God does it all. The power is uh, in God and the message of the cross. And he kind of spurs us on to share that. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned a little bit before there's a, a approval, like searching for approval of people still. And we yeah. still, we're still wrecked. I still want to do things on my own. I still want to be like, no, God, I got this. But what about sharing with other people? So do you have those moments now as a follower of Jesus where your weakness and you're like, God, I don't, I'm too weak, I'm too busted, or I don't want to lose this person's approval, or what's that like now? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
I mean, I, I just kind of like I get that nudge, that nudge to the Holy Spirit of like, I should say something, I should do something. So I think you've already, you've already seen my work. So there was a time where uh, I, when I was, I was kind of new to Dubai, I'd, I'd been at work for a few months. And at that point, it was near Christmas time. And I, I had a coworker ask me like, oh, what are you doing? What are you doing uh, this week? And I, I mentioned like, oh, it's, it's around Christmas. So I'm going to go to church and I'm super excited to be able to like go to this and set up for it because what else was I going to do that day? And then they said, oh, I didn't, I didn't know you go to church. I didn't know you were a Christian. And that, that hit me. Mm. And I, I was like, people I work with don't know. Uh, how do they not know? I, I thought I was really open about it. I guess I wasn't at all. And I guess I didn't say anything. And why would, why would they know if I hadn't said anything? Mm. And so then I just started inviting everyone to church. <laughs> I, can, I can see you going around like, you guys, you guys, you guys, this is awesome. You should come, you should come, you should come, you should come, you should come. Pretty much. I was just handing out fellowship flyers of like, I don't know if, I don't know if like church is important to you. I don't know if Christmas is something you celebrate, but it's something I celebrate and it's something I really enjoy around this time of year and you're welcome to come. Here's an invitation. If you want to come join, I'd love for you to come. I'm, there's some other people coming as well. Like welcome to join us. And I just started sharing with everyone and almost everyone said yes. <laughs> I don't think I was expecting that. I think sometimes we can build up in our head the, like, the rejection, you know, like I think oftentimes we overthink sharing that we're gonna, we're gonna either, for me, like losing that acceptance, um, maybe, maybe for you it could be feeling like, or even like feeling like, I don't know, there's like just too much brokenness in here, like to be able to like get that, communicate that well, or mm. if there, there's issues in that. But I found that so oftentimes what's missing is an invitation. Mm. Katie, thank you so much. Really appreciate you showing us around Green Planet. And thanks for sharing uh, in this conversation. I found it really encouraging to hear of other people's weaknesses and God's strength. So thanks a lot. Yeah, uh, It's been great to have you here. And we're going to close by singing a song. Uh, it's by a band I know you like, Casting Crowns, uh, Love Moved First. So uh, as you reflect on that song, what are some of the concepts that we can have in our ears as we respond? So I really enjoy it because it just, it reminds me of, of God, God's love first. God's acceptance came first. And as a result, it, it helps me to remember that now it's my time to move mm. and to act on that. Mm. I love the fact that God is the one that initiates and he's the one that reaches out to us. So. Uh, as we sing it, we can reflect on the lyrics as well. But before we sing, uh, I want to just pray and let's thank God for his power as we reflect on the conversation. Yes. Yeah. Father, thanks. Uh, thanks that even though we're weak and that we seek approval and we try and do things on our own, uh, Father, that <laughs> even though we try and add two things, uh, that you remind us again that we're weak, but you are the one that has all the power. So give us great confidence as we go out and share this message of your strength in, with a world that's longing for health and repair. And God, thank you that you have moved first. Amen. <laughs>